There we go. Good morning. This is Jennifer. This is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, and this is the day after Thanksgiving. Are you guys awake yet? <laughs> I wasn't sure if I could do it, but look at me. I'm here. Day after Thanksgiving, no food coma. Super mellow day yesterday. It was our very first Thanksgiving that we spent, just the two of us, three if you count our little dog, Lucy. <laughs> But uh, we had family out of the area, and it just worked out really nice to spend the time, just the two of us, yesterday. It was really fun. Uh, we ended up going out for dinner. Never done that before. That was the first on a Thanksgiving. Well, I think we've gone out to dinner before years ago with family, but this is the first time we did it, just the two of us. Local restaurant, really great little place. Shout out to Ravello in Uptown Whittier, which we really love. Might even go back there tonight. So, uh, anyway, hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. You have a good one. You have fun. Hang out with family. Eat too much. Eat uh, just the right amount, maybe. That's what we did yesterday. We didn't eat too much. It was nice. Um, just had a good time. And uh, I, I'd be curious today. I ask a question every day to, to hear from, back from you. But today, I'd be curious. What is your favorite um, side that comes with Thanksgiving? You know, do you like to... The, if you had to just, you could only pick one, you could have your meat and then you could have your side. Of course, your meat's going to be turkey. Even if you don't like it, you have to have turkey for Thanksgiving. And uh, I didn't because I was at a restaurant. <laughs> I had prime rib. Um, maybe have prime rib for Thanksgiving. Right. What, what's your favorite side though? It, does it have to be mashed potatoes? Um, and does it, or does it have to be cranberries? I mean, if you could only have one, the green beans. Oh, and if you like the green beans, do you like just the green beans? Or do you like the green bean casserole? Do you like mac and cheese? Do you like yams, sweet potatoes? Now I'm feeling sad that I could only pick one. Okay, fine. You could pick two. Because if I were you, I could not pick one. I love all those sides. Stuffing. And hey, do you guys call it stuffing or dressing? Just curious. All right, enough of that. <laughs> Let's get on to our study. Let me switch us over to our study page. Click onto that so you can see that. We are continuing on um, in our study, of course, of, of Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> we're in 13 and 14 today. And uh, let's begin with prayer, and then we'll see if we can, how we're doing on our memory verse. Let's, let's practice that also. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this group of people who join us for the Bible study. I ask that your hand of blessing would be on their lives today. And uh, thank you for drawing us together through your word. Uh, bless our time together right now to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's practice our verse. Switch over to the screen with that has that on there. This is Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. Switch over to that. A little peek at Facebook there. <laughs> All right. So our verse is um, from the end of chapter 4 as it leads us into the beginning of chapter 15 and Jesus being our high priest, why he's qualified and how that impacts us. For we do not have a high priest who is unable for, we do have one, we just don't have this one. We do not have a high priest. I hope you can explain now why we need a high priest, if anybody asks you that. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. How are you doing? Do you have it by heart? Oh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is the Bible study. We write the memory verse out each day and um, practice that, you know, get going with that. So don't just listen. Grab a piece of paper. Write this out. This is Hebrews 4, verses 15 to 16. And we're writing it. I'm memorizing it from the English Standard Version or ESV Bible. Memorize it, whichever one you want. Um, but if you want to match up with me, it'll be out of the ESV. Oh, I just made a rhyme. If you want to match up with me, it'll be from the ESV. Oh, I'm rhyming on the day after Thanksgiving. Look at that. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. With our weak Nesses, uh, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, but who in every respect, I don't need to look, why was I looking? I have this summarized now, has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Therefore, oh, therefore, that's when the old version I memorized it. Let us, 
<laughs> Let us then with confidence, or I might just do that. I might have just thrown that left therefore in there. I don't know. I don't think that's not in the, the other version I memorized. Um, let us then with confidence draw near, near to what? The throne of grace. What will we find when we get to the throne of grace? That we may find mercy and grace to help. To help. My nose is running. The morning runny nose, right, Courtney? <laughs> I'm shouting out to Courtney because she watches on YouTube and she commented on the YouTube video that her nose runs all the time as well. That we and grace to help. Um, mercy and find grace to help. Yeah. In time of need. In time of need. Good job. How'd you do? Pretty good? Get it all down? I hope so. All right, let's pop back over to our lesson here. So we are in Hebrews 5, of course. Um, 10 to 14 is our scripture to memorize. So go ahead and open up your Bibles. Not memorize, sorry. Um, our read-through scripture for today. Um, we always go back through and cycle back and um, for sure read our focus scripture for the day. Sometimes we read a larger passion. Um, passage. Uh, today is slightly bigger um, because our passage is Hebrews, um, uh, what is it, 13 to 14, but we're going to back up to verse 10. All right, so let me get this called up here. Why am I talking in a Martian voice? I do not know. Here we go. <laughs> Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So let's go ahead and work through our questions. Sorry about that. I just realized I don't think I clicked you over to that. I clicked over to it, but then I didn't click you. Sorry, sorry about that. And I can't hear you or see you. So, and it's always, a, it's always a delay. If you're doing the live, it's a delay. So I didn't get to see that. So sorry about that. But here you go. Back to the lesson. So the heart of the author, as we studied yesterday, is for the audience to have been ready to teach, but they are not. He's pausing to point this out, and he's not holding back. The Apostle Paul exhorted along these same lines. And uh, let's go ahead and read through that. Now, just for review, from the very beginning of this lesson, when um, we worked through who the author of Hebrews was, I, um, we talked about some of, some of the different possibilities of who the author has been suggested to be. Paul, Apollos, Luke, Priscilla, um, who else? Anyway, those, those are a few of the main ones. Uh, Priscilla just more recently, and by recently, I mean like in the last 150 years. Um, uh, the more I read it, though, especially when I was studying chapter six to get ready for next week's lesson, I'm thinking it might be Luke. There's a lot of phrasing that's unique to Luke's writings from um, the Gospel of Luke, as well as Acts and that are only found also in Hebrews. Really interesting on that. I've been noticing that as I go and do my word studies, I see this word is only used three times, and it's used two times in Hebrews and one time in Luke or one time in Acts. And that is a theory that he wrote it. So I'm thinking maybe he wrote it. Maybe, maybe Paul worked with him. Maybe he wrote it with Paul. Anyway, Paul talked to him about it, and then Luke put it into, his, into the words. Anyway. On a side note there, that was my new thinking process as I was studying yesterday, which was nice to do, by the way. I had a nice long day of studying at home. All right, 2 Timothy 2, 24, and then 3, 14 through 17. I'm make sure I click over this time too so you can see it. All right, so again, what we're thinking about here is how does Paul describe what the Lord's servant, a Christian, uh, should be doing. And so think about that as we're reading through our, our scripture here. 
And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. <laughs> and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Thankfully, he did not say must not be tongue tied. <laughs> that would eliminate me all the time. But be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Get that middle phrase there. Able to what? Yeah, able to teach. Second Timothy three. That is for you. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Pretty cool, huh? So back to our question here. How does Paul describe what the Lord's servant, a Christian, should be doing? We should be teaching. We should be patient. Um, in the context of what we're studying here, though, from Hebrews admonishing them that they should have been teachers by now, keep in mind Paul's wording again back in that Timothy 3 passage that he said, from childhood you've been acquainted for, uh, with sacred writings. And considering the audience that we know or we're making an educated guess on, since they aren't specifically addressed in a greeting at the beginning of the epistle, or sermon really, um, we know that they are... Um, Hebrews, they're Jews, they're Messianic Jews, they're Jews that have accepted Jesus as their Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, so um, Jesus, their Messiah. They would have been acquainted with all of these sacred writings from childhood, like Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. And he admonishes them um, to um, be equipped to know it and to be able to teach it. Write that down. So underline able to teach in your Bible also. And write Hebrews 5.12 in the margin and connect those two verses. If your Bible doesn't already give you cross-references, uh, then write it in. And cross-references are the little, there's a little letter A, B, C, D by, by a word or a phrase in your Bible. And then you look to the margin or the bottom chunk of your Bible and there'll be little tiny verses. Those are called cross-references. And that'll take you to another verse that either uses that word, uses that phrase, or has that same theme, uh, concept. Um, your cross-reference cross code for your Bible is explained in the beginning of your Bible. Yes, your Bible has a beginning, like instructions. It, it talks about how the people who pulled together the scripture um, and, and organized it in that study Bible or the, whatever Bible you're using. Um, and it'll explain how your cross-references are used also. Anyway, so write that down if it isn't already. And if it is, just highlight it and make a pencil mark to connect it together. It's really good to do that. It'll help you to remember your scripture better. When you go back and your pastor preaches on something or you study it again or you're in another Bible study at a later date and you see it again, boy, all the bells and whistles go off in your brain and you start making connections better and better. Um, that's why I love writing in a good Bible that can hold up to has good enough paper quality and space hold up to writing in it. So what do you read is a key part of being able to teach? And what you've, based on what you've read above, as well as what you've been studying in Hebrews. What is a key part of being able to teach? Well, let's take a look back to Hebrews 4.12. Um, and that scripture might be already rattling around in your mind <laughs> um, as where I'm going with this point here. But the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's our memory verse from last week, right? All right. So, and what does, what did Paul um, put forth? Um, the Lord's bond servant should be able to teach, but listen to this focus here. All scripture is inspired by God, All right? So we're able, we're able to teach. Why? Because we are basically infused with the scripture. It just oozes from us. The more I'm in the word, the more I find great comfort and confidence as I'm sharing and talking with other people, not because I'm so great, but because uh, the Holy Spirit has been working within me in the power of his word. Why? Because the, his word is alive. And when I'm not in the word, I, I do find myself at, at a loss 
Um, I, I don't feel like I have a well to draw from when people ask questions or want to engage with me or there's um, a social issue that comes up that presents a challenge. But when I have the scripture rattling around in my brain, growing in my heart, um, it's like a tool the Holy Spirit himself is, is using through me and it does enable me to teach. So I don't want anybody here listening to be intimidated about the prospect of teaching just because you were not paid as a professional teacher. I've been a teacher my entire life. I've been teaching since I graduated, well, even before then, since I graduated from college. But even when I was a kid, I was one of those who was always in the Awana and the Sunday school and the VBS and one of the volunteer teachers, as, even as a young, young person, probably from the time I was uh, 11 years old and, and forward, I was teaching. Raised by teachers. My dad was a pastor. My mom was a teacher for growing up as well in the church and in our school. I took algebra from my mom, little known fact. If you ever have a quiz about Jennifer Richmond, that might come up. You'll be able to answer that someday. Jennifer's mom was her algebra teacher and Spanish. Bonus round. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> back to our uh, lesson. Um, thinking and engaging and moving forward here, <clears throat> reading Hebrews 5.13 now, how does the author describe a Christian who is still on milk? So we went over that, or been thinking through that, but let's really understand this. For everyone who's on milk is unskilled in the what? In the word of righteousness. Do you see? Do you see this connection here? So you might think that you are able <laughs> to engage with our culture, engage with, engage with people, because you've got good rhetoric skills, you've got good words, right? You know how to talk to people. But the word of God says you are still on milk because you're not skilled in the word of righteousness. You don't, you don't have God's word coming out of your mouth. Let's put that as our priority, right? So underline the word of righteousness in your Bible. This phrase is from the Greek, literally meaning, oh no. Did I skip that? Oh, I did. Somehow that got deleted from your... That got deleted from your lesson. How odd. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and bop over to show you this, what this literally means. This is from a great... Uh, search tool that will help you in your studies as well. Um, Bible Hub is one of them. There's quite a few. This is one of my favorites. It's gotten easy for me to read this. Um, so back in Hebrews 5.13, let me look up the Greek for you so that you can see how to do this. In fact, let me make sure the screen's being shared so you can see the screen. All right. So we're on um, Hebrews 5.13. This is Bible Hub's website. And you can see there at the top, I'll just a little behind the scenes to show you how to do this. Um, oh, that's too big. Sorry. There we go. Back to the right size. Move that up in the corner. Okay. Bible Hub, you can see that up here in the corner, Hebrews 5.13. I just typed it up there, hit enter. All right. So when it opens up, it defaults to a parallel view of a bunch of different scriptures. Um, a study Bible here from the Berean study Bible, which is good. Um, the third one down is going to be your English Standard Version, which is what I use. New Living, which is not recommended, um, <laughs> but it is a paraphrase. And then a New International Version. So, and then a little bit further down, you'll have probably what many of you also use, like I used to, which is the New American Standard. I do recommend that one as well. And then the King James um, which is difficult because it still has the Elizabethan, Elizabethan English. All right, so what you do is you find your verse that you want to take a look, and then you click the button that says interlinear. Now, I took Greek and studied that for a while, so for me, I can read the Greek, um, but I don't always remember what the words mean. So <clears throat> I go and find it. Um, everybody who is unskilled in the word of righteousness, or people who aren't joining us in the live. All right, so unskill, aparos, um, is the, when you see a word that in Greek it begins with the letter A, alpha in Greek, um, R A, um, it, it's a negating letter, it means not. And um, so paros, um, peria, is from the word peria. You can see the breakdown of the word here. And um, not tested, not tested. All right, so, and then it'll break it down sometimes and tell you things like um, where, here, I'll show you up here. 
where this is found elsewhere in the Bible. So this is what I was talking to you about, the uniqueness of um, words in the Hebrew, uh, I mean, in the book of Hebrews. And uh, actually, there's 55 plus different words that are unique to Hebrews, which is the most of any um, book of the Bible. Hebrews has the most. Anyway, so um, literally means not A for not, alpha not, and tested. So apologize again for that, for skipping that. And those poor people who don't join us on the live are the ones going, I don't understand this Bible study. I know it's because it's just me writing it. And I forget and I somehow delete important things like that. This phrase from the Greek literally meaning not tested. And why are they unskilled in the word of righteousness? Because they're still on milk. They're still on milk. They're, they're not digging in to... Um, um, the solid food. They're acting like children still, who should even babies, really, um, who need milk still, not even ready to move on to solid food. So pass that along to your friends. Those of you who are small group leaders in our study, share this with your small group um, gals and let them know um, that that word means um, not tested, literally means not tested, unskilled. Okay. Um, oh, and that phrase. Let me go back to the phrase also so you can see that. Get my share screen back up. Okay, so um, the word of righteousness is logos. So we can see in the word of righteousness and clicking again here. Hopefully by now in this study, you are you already know what logos means. It comes up a lot in our study. It's a very common word. Three hundred and thirty-one occurrences in the New Testament, um, and uh, it means depending on its context, it can mean logic, it could be thinking, it could be reasoning, um, it could be just word, you can see here the definition, um, word, speech, divine utterance, analogy even, okay, and it's from leg Lego, not Lego, like Legos you build with, although that is an interesting metaphor to think about, um, meaning to speak with a conclusion, so word, literally, the word word, like Jesus is the word as well, and then we have this other Greek word, um, diakos, uh, diak, diak, <laughs> That's a tongue twister one. All right. That's righteousness. All right. And righteousness is interesting because it has um, the dike word here, a judicial verdict. Um, we have um, several different words that come from that. Um, but um, it, it means righteousness, it means justice here, and in particular, it, use, it refers to God's judicial favor in a word. So enjoy using Bible Hub, you'll get accustomed to it, and even if you don't read or understand the Greek letters or have an understanding of how root words work, um, it's still a great resource, and you will gain quite a bit from doing that. All right, why are they unskilled? They are children. I'll address this idea as well in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, and 13, um, 11. So let's pop over to that. Open up your Bibles. i get that up on the screen for you. Make sure it is. There you go. Um, and let's read that. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not food, for you were not ready for it. Even now you're not ready for it. Um, for you are still of the flesh. While there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? When I was a child, I spoke like a child. When I thought, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So Paul addresses this concept as well. What parallels do you read in, this, um, script, in these scriptures? Well, we're seeing a desire for the uh, author to his audience to move forward, but he can't because they are acting like children still. There's petty behaviors going on and they're not ready to move on. They're not skilled in righteousness. Uh, I mean, and they're not skilled in the word of righteousness. And so Peter also urges growth in his letter as well. What does Peter urge? Let's take a look at 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, 18. So like newborn infants long for the spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation. So there's a longing for spiritual milk. So it's not that the milk is bad, of course. Babies have to grow on milk. Could you imagine if you don't even give your kid baby food? You just grow them up and hand them a steak. Here's your tomahawk steak, knock yourself out. No, you wouldn't even hand them a Cheerio when they were first born. 
they have to develop so that they can appreciate that and their bodies can take it in. The same thing goes with us spiritually. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace. To him be the glory now and forever. Uh, now into the day of eternity. Amen. All right. So again, we have Peter here saying, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior and reminding them to be like newborn infants, to long for spiritual milk. You may grow up into salvation, but we need to make sure we don't park it there. <laughs> we don't not grow, right? All right. So this goes back to the dull of hearing issue. It's not just dull, but it was lack of effort, laziness. He's now saying they're unskilled. A payros, which literally means untried. They have no experience because they haven't even practiced, which puts all this in direct contrast to Jesus. Consider that as you answer the following. Consider the difference in the author's admonition in this passage and Jesus' teaching in Mark 10, 14. Both teach of being like a child. What do you think is the difference? Remember when Jesus had this passage here, when he said this, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them and laid hands on them. Sorry, I didn't pop you over to that, but um, hold on. Get back to our... There you go. <laughs> so what's the difference here? Being, um, both teach of being like a child. What do you think is the difference? Are we being childish or are we being childlike? That's the difference. We need to be childlike. In other words, with abandon, with full, just arms open, running forward like a child does, tr in full trust of their father, of their mother, of, of, of the of the of the heavenly father right just running out there but not childish immature right um being mature and yet still having that childlike faith there's a difference and it's beautiful when you think about it what a wonderful thing to combine having that in our own heart today as we pray what if we just studied about jesus and his role as our high priest well, let's take a look back at hebrews 4 15 and 5 7 through 8 as a review but we have just studied about him remember we've just talked about the immature being unskilled in the word let's take a look at jesus we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness but one who is every respect has been tempted as we are but without sin in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So we've just studied about him in, in our role. He is not unsympathetic. He's sympathetic because he's been tried and tested. And he was obedient. He was reverent. He made it through the testing and he was without sin. Hebrews 5.14, um, we'll use now to go through these questions and answer the following. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Did you catch that? Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice, to discern good from evil. Now let's answer some questions about that. Who is the solid food for? The, that's right, mature. How does the author describe the mature? Those who have their powers of discernment trained. Now, of course, remember I'm using the English Standard Version that helps us to be united when we move through the Bible study so that I can do fill in the blanks like this with you. So if you're like, hey, my Bible doesn't say it that way, you can either rewrite it and get the, the sense of it, um, or you can just go to the ESV and use that, which is, the, like I've been saying for the last year, by the way, <laughs> this is our Bible. If you're new to the Bible study, you maybe didn't know that, but that is what we've been doing. 
how um, how are their powers trained by what by constant practice constant practice I just die a little inside when people tell me and I literally have had people tell me this I don't have time to do Bible study literally I've had someone tell me that before as if there was an option as if that was up there, like on God's list of things that you could opt out of. I don't have time to be in the word. <laughs> I would love for someone to find the, the backup verse that supports that excuse. It's what it is. It's an excuse. It drives me nuts. And that's not my role to convict somebody of that sin of saying that they don't have time for Bible study. And it's also not my role to define what Bible study looks like, but I'll tell you right now what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like opening up your Bible at church on Sunday. And the last time you did was the previous Sunday. Oh, I've been there. I have absolutely been there in seasons of my life where I went to open up the word, sat down at church. And I thought in my heart, uh Oh, I picked up this Bible from the exact same spot in my kitchen where I had said it after I got home from church the previous Sunday. Yeah, not good. And I just, I, I, it, it came over me over a season because I, I was raised in the word. I knew the word. I went to Bible college. I teach all the time. And it came over me that I wasn't personally obeying God by being in the word. I wasn't by in constant practice in the word myself. I was just Sunday to Sunday and only just opening. That's not me being really practicing it. Man, I got convicted by that. I pray you will too. I pray. Now, this isn't a guilt thing. This is absolutely not a guilt thing. If you're receiving it as a guilt thing, that's on you. That's not on me. That might be the Holy Spirit actually too. Um, <laughs> it's not a guilt trip thing at all. This is the word of God, folks. This is God saying constant practice, period. I got, I got no other verse that backs up anything else but being the word and being in it constantly. Um, it's not you on the websites doing Greek and Hebrew word studies, although super, super awesome. So, so fun. Love doing that. This is you be constantly practicing the word, which enables them to do what? What is it enabled them to do? To distinguish good from evil. I'm telling you right now, if we are in any state in America, in this world right now, it's people not, not being honest about the distinguishing between good and evil. I know God's truth is written on our hearts and everyone knows the truth. It's written on people's hearts. People know men are men and women are women, period. Period, they do. There's, there's, you have to lie so much to be dishonest about that. Um, but when you're in the word, you're constantly practicing, you, you don't feel fuzzy about it in society. You don't have the, well, maybe this or that could work, or maybe someone could. No, nope. you know good from evil, right? It makes a huge difference in how you engage in, in the world and giving you that confidence to engage with people, um, with, with um, you know, people who are Christians and people who are, are secular. So does this describe you? Are you constantly practicing? Are you able to distinguish good from evil without wavering? I mean, obviously everyone can distinguish good from evil. Like I said, it's written on our hearts, but when you're not in the word, you get a little fuzzy about it in the sense that you make allowances for bad behavior or you call bad good and good bad, right? Does that describe you? Or are you at that stage right now, like I came to be, like I love being in the word. I love being in the word. There it is. I said it. <laughs> I can't get enough of it, right? Maybe, maybe you're there too. Yay. And you can't get enough of it, and you're drinking it in, and you're enjoying it so much, and um, it's a, it's a huge joy in your life. That's awesome. Describe where you are right now. Write your thoughts down there. So, if it does, what encouragement? If this does describe you, what encouragement can you offer others? Maybe you look at the, this and you're like, "Yes, this is where I'm at. I'm moving on to solid food. I'm in the Word. I'm practicing it. I am discerning good from evil." <laughs> I don't feel fuzzy in my brain and my heart anymore, right? Because the word is rattling around and growing inside me. So if that describes you, what encouragement can you give to others? If it doesn't, what's, what's next for you? What does that look like? You're in this Bible study. That's a good next. That's a great step. You've, you've made time to put the word as a priority, at least to be in this Bible study. Awesome. 
are you sensing in your heart right now that there's an up level that you're ready to move on? Um, that you maybe you are just desiring more consistency. Maybe you allow the Bible study to pile up a bit and you got two or three days behind you of I didn't even get to it. You know, my schedule was so crazy. And are you at that point now where you're realizing my schedule was crazy, but I didn't make the time to prioritize or I was on vacation. And so that means you're not in the word. You don't, you don't want to be on the, I don't know. I just don't see that. I don't see any biblical grounds for I'm on vacation. So I'm not going to read the word. Uh, it's Thanksgiving. So I'm not going to be in the word. It's whatever. No, I, every day, constant practice, not sporadic practice. Right? So who can you reach out to? either to share your enthusiasm and your growth and encouragement and come alongside? Um, or who can you reach out to to come alongside you and say, I need help to be in the Word more consistently. I, I want this for me. I want that. Are you ready to embrace what it really means to be a follower of Christ? Is this is what it looks like. So remember, in closing, that up to 512, chapter 5, verse 12, the author was getting ready to move on to some important details about Jesus, but he's had to put the brakes on what that top, on that topic, there we go, and pause to admonish his audience. He doesn't want to move on without them. He has to make them aware of a major issue. So he is doing what the Holy Spirit has already prompted him to write earlier in the message, and he is exhorting them that none of them may be hardened by the deceitfulness the deceitfulness of sin. I'm getting Irish here in my writing. Hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The Bible is simple enough for a child to wade in, yet deep enough for an elephant to drown. God expects us to grow in maturity and grow in knowledge over the course of our Christian lives. Pray that you would value his word and come to maturity. Make a plan today to continue to grow as you, um, as you have been in this study. Um, I will say right now in that closing sentence, is, that's why I added this, is because this idea of making a plan is essential. It's one thing to be convicted in your heart right now and think, yeah, I need to do this. This is important to me. I really want to. I've been wanting to for a long time. And you're thinking that in your heart, in your mind right now. But I'll tell you right now, just from personal experience, I mean, this isn't true for you, but for sure true for me. Whenever I've been in that moment of my life at a crossroads of, yeah, I really need to do that, it just stays in the, yeah, I really need to do that phase. It never does happen. It's like when you say to your friends, hey, let's get together. But you don't, you don't get together because you never put it on the calendar. You never made a plan. You never said, hey, let's get together. How's Tuesday? <laughs> hey, let's get together. Let's go to Ravello, Jennifer's new favorite Italian restaurant in Whittier, right? Like, let's do that. No, you don't do that. You make a plan. You actually do get together or you're not going to get together. The same thing's going to happen today. You're going to finish this study today and you're going to be thinking, I need this more. I need to take this. I need to take God at his word. And when it says to be in constant practice or else I'm like a spiritual baby, I don't want that to be me. How can I have constant practice? What do I need to do? Memorize, um, be in a Bible study. Awesome. Good job. Um, you're here. Um, get get a, a fellowship partner, somebody that you can call up and say, all right, I, I would love to get better at this. I need someone, I need some accountability. It, call me. I would love to engage with you that way. And you're thinking, oh, you probably have people call you all the time. Guess what? It's weird. I don't. I don't. And um, people don't call me all the time. I don't know. They, hopefully they're calling everybody else. Or maybe they're just making assumptions that everybody else is calling everybody else. Isn't that the weirdest thing? And then nobody calls anybody? Anyway, call me. Call someone today surprise someone and say, I need an accountability partner. I want to run with somebody into maturity. I want to grow. I want to take God at his word. Make this true in your life today. Make a plan today. You're going to click at the end of this podcast. You're going to stop listening to the end of this video in just a few seconds. And if you haven't moved forward to make that plan, I guarantee you it will not happen. So um, let me come back over here. I should have opened up. There I am. Big, big as life again. I, w I want to encourage you to let this be true to you, but to move from that to really making that plan to making that happen. So again, if that's somebody that you already have in mind that, you know, gosh, this would be a great person to partner with, reach out to them. Um, if you already have that person in mind, if you don't have a person in mind, call me, email me. 
and we'll partner together. I'm always here Monday through Friday for the Bible study. Sunday, Saturday and Sunday be a great opportunity for you to practice this on your own. Sunday, of course, so hopefully you'll be in church. If you're not already attending a great church, I do recommend our wonderful church in La Mirada. Um, small enough where people know you and big enough where you can rattle around and, and um, have different ministry options. So, all right. Enjoy the rest of your Friday, whatever day today is, and I look forward to being with you. I'll be here um, Monday for our uh, Create and Share, but it might be a time for you to do Create and Share over the weekend. Maybe you'll just go ahead and do it over the weekend. Uh, either way, I'll see you Monday morning, bright and early, 7 a.m., back, back in here for this um, study again. And then, of course, Monday night is our Bible study, 6.30 p.m. at the church on Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. Look forward to being with you in person. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Click my buttons here. <laughs> there we go. Click my buttons so I can say goodnight or goodbye. Talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.